Hello everyone. We are very happy to have Professor Viral Acharya with us today. Viral is currently a professor of finance at the New York University Stern School of Business. He's prolific and highly cited researcher in the field of finance. He mainly studies systemic risk, its regulation, and the government, how it can induce distortion in this market. Viral has also served as the deputy governor at the Reserve Bank of India between 2017 and 2019. In fact, I was very lucky to be working at the RBI at the same time and got a chance to work alongside with him. Hello, Viral. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, it's my pleasure, Shekhar. Uh, lovely to be interacting with you and the Indian School of Business community. Thank you, Viral, once again. So I'll start out with the first question about the history. Uh, and I'm basically trying to understand your transition from the academia to the RBI, basically a policy role. What was the genesis behind this transition? And if you may allow me to ask, what was the reason for your resignation during the middle of your tenure? Uh, as you pointed out, Shekhar, I mainly work in the area of systemic risk, uh, financial stability, regulation of banks and non-bank financial institutions. Uh, for someone in academia who does work in this area, uh, not just theoretical, but also empirical and applied, uh, in some sense, a central bank is perhaps the most interesting place to be in the whole world. Uh, you know, you get a 35,000 feet view of the macro economy, both in a, I would say, domestic as well as a global context. Uh, and it gives you the ability to put the frameworks uh, that you have been working on to see the world, make sense of it, and try and make the world a better place in some way uh, to the extent you can. Uh, so, you know, when the opportunity became available uh, in July, August of 2016, when I applied for it, uh, and then had the interview in December 16, uh, to start sometime in January 17, uh, you know, for me, it was really a great opportunity, uh, both uh, from a personal standpoint, as well as uh, for having a chance to do something and give back to India in a substantial way. Uh, well, you know, I had a, a very enriching and fulfilling two and a half years at the Reserve Bank. Uh, I hope the Reserve Bank and the country <laughs> feel the same way about my stint. Uh, you know, on the resignation, there were some personal reasons, some professional. So let me just leave it at that. Okay, let's start out by this big question in the banking sector, which is the non-performing asset or the NPA crisis. Uh, this problem has been lingering for at least a decade now. And if I may say, there was this controversial Feb 12th circular during your tenure, which basically you wanted to do things in a certain way to resolve the NPA crisis. So I want to know your opinion on the overall NPA problem and what this specific circular wanted to achieve. Uh, yes, uh, of course, it's a very big issue, so uh, I may not be able to do full justice to it in, in the brief span of a few minutes. Uh, for those who are really interested in reading about it in more detail, I encourage you to look at my book, uh, Quest for Restoring Financial Stability in India, or, uh, you know, former Governor Patel's book, Overdraft, uh, to get a better handle on this. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, my take is that India goes through these leverage boom and bust cycles of bank lending on a very regular basis. Uh, in fact, many banking observers and practitioners would contend uh, that this happens at least once a decade. Sometimes we are lucky and we get out of the bad loan cycle through extraordinary stimulus from the United States or the Federal Reserve such as the low interest rate environment after the dot-com crash, when you know, we sort of tided over a bad loans crisis through that. But then came the global financial crisis, uh, growth had to be pump primed at all costs. Uh, and as we always do, we used our banking sector, notably the public sector banks to throw good money after the bad. Some of it was in infrastructure, some in steel, uh, some in ports uh, and several such uh, sort of, I would say, brick and mortar industries where there is assets to lend uh, against for banks. 
Uh, and uh, not just in India, but the world over, when a fiscal stimulus is deployed in this manner through the banking sector, which is you tell banks to go and lend, set them quotas, or tell them to lend to X, Y, Z, either sectorally or individually, uh, invariably bad things happen because uh, monitoring, screening, and due diligence disciplines go through the go for a toss. Uh, bankers are busy just getting projects approved at all costs. Corporate finance valuation teams and consulting teams are busy uh, just rigging up numbers to justify loans rather than actually telling, don't make this loan. Uh, and, you know, that may take some time for all that to come to roost, but inevitably it does when economy slows down. And in our case, once we had the 12, 13 slowdown tightening of the general global market conditions, uh, the non-performing assets uh, started resurfacing. Now, the real question then is what next? As I told you, sometimes we are lucky and low interest rates globally take us out of that. Uh, but in 13, 14, we weren't lucky with that. Maybe we didn't have a little bit of an oil price bonanza for a while and interest rates came down uh, in India as well as a result of that. So for a while, we could postpone this problem without actually it becoming a banking crisis, so to speak. Uh, but then uh, inevitably that had to end too, uh, and inflation uh, didn't decline further. It required some adjustments globally. The Federal Reserve started not just raising interest rates, but also normalizing its balance sheet. So there was a global tightening. Uh, and then we had to deal with the problem head on. Uh, the problem in India is that uh, the, the bankruptcy system has been weak. Uh, it had been weak. Uh, to add to the woes on top of that, banks don't file uh, problem assets for quick resolution because our provisioning against losses is very backloaded. So it's better for banks to hang on to the assets on their balance sheet if you can just keep classifying them as standard so that you don't have to provide for these provisions. The fact that the economic value of the asset is declining is irrelevant to the banks because the regulators are not marking you to actually uh, put them on the balance sheet at the right prices. Uh, and we did fix the first part of it, which is that the Indian uh, sort of insolvency and bankruptcy code of India came into place uh, in August to December 16. And that created a window of opportunity uh, 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 in order to get these cases to be filed into bankruptcy for prompt resolution. So what did the FEP 12 circular of the Reserve Bank of India do? Uh, it basically, uh, you know, supported by uh, a legal mandate that we thought we had, uh, we started directing banks uh, in a proportionality sense, going after the legacy NPAs, which were the largest in size, to be directed to the IBC because, as I explained, banks don't do this on their own in India, uh, especially for the large cases where economic costs of marking down their books would be high if they are not getting capital in, in at the same time that the capital is being written off. Uh, as you can imagine, this was not popular with the incumbents in certain sectors because they stood to lose their assets uh, to other owners. Uh, invariably, that means there is lobbying. Uh, they lobby the government. Uh, maybe it creates pressures on other arms of the democratic machinery of the country. But uh, be as it may, whatever the causes be, in the end, uh, the legal mandate that the RBI that thought it had uh, was struck down uh, by the judiciary. Uh, I have never fully understood uh, what was the what are the technical grounds for striking down the mandate? So that's where we are. And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Why is it that every time we have a bankruptcy code, we keep revising? We had Sarfezi, then we had insolvency and bankruptcy code. And yet somehow the forces in the Indian ecosystem come together and somehow we get um, uh, we get a ruling from the judiciary that holds the system back. And uh, clearly, you know, the judiciary works under a set of principles. But I think we have to ask ourselves the deeper question of why is it that the ecosystem never allows the bankruptcy system to clean up the non-performing assets mess 
in a fast and resolute manner as the country needs. Uh, of course, what has happened now since then is that, again, a period of low interest rates, equity issuances available at very low cost has again meant that the corporate sector has deleveraged. But of course, we can't take it for granted that there will never be non-performing assets in future. There will be. In fact, even now, the stock of NPAs in India is pretty large. It's just that it's much lower than what it used to be. And we are going through fairly turbulent times, in my view, right now, with oil prices simmering, the Fed likely to tighten its monetary policy because of domestic inflation in the United States and very high demand meeting supply side constraints at the same time. So we'll have to wait and see. I'll follow up this with one more question. Uh, what do you think about the bad banks creation? Do you think it's going to solve the NPA problem? Uh, so, you know, I, I wrote a piece with uh, Raghuram Rajan uh, uh, last year on Indian banking, a time to reform. Uh, we try to explain that it really depends upon what you do with the bad bank. So just setting up a bad bank and moving non-performing assets from existing banks into the bad bank doesn't in itself solve the problem. Many of our banks are already supported by the government. The bad bank will also be supported by the government. The question is whether consolidation and aggregation of bad loans into the bad bank leads to a speedier and swifter resolution of the underlying assets, because then you unlock the economic efficiency of these assets. Also, if you simply transfer these assets from uh, existing banks to the bad bank at above normal prices, which is higher than the recovery that you would get on these assets, then it's just a backdoor recapitalization of these banks. Ultimately, the taxpayer will have to foot the bill anyways. So you really have to ensure that the resolution is efficient on the bad bank's uh, balance sheet. To do that, you need to equip the bad bank with the right incentives. You need to hire it with the right quality human capital. Uh, it would have to be someone who has resolution expertise, ideally within the insolvency and bankruptcy code of India. Uh, but going forward, I think one other thought that I would put on the table is that you can see the complications. You can see the complications of having to push through a lot of cases through the bankruptcy code and then there being forces in the ecosystem coming together to like lean against it. Uh, you can see the complications of setting up a bad bank. So my sense is right now, broadly, the bank lending system in India can be described as uh, throw money in the in the easy phase of the leverage cycle at whatever is available and hope for the best um, and you know that's not a good way to run a banking system or the or manage the lending cycle uh, we have to uh, be able to identify losses ahead of time we have to prepare the banking system for upcoming losses provision for them ahead of time, because that is what will create incentives in banks to make good loans ahead of time. Because if everything is backloaded, if bank losses and their recognition is entirely backloaded, then it becomes more and more worth it for the bankers to gamble on just lending out money in good times, because it's just a tail risk. Next, we would like to understand the role of the RBI in the overall economy and connect it to some of the discussion that you have generated in the past. We know you have been a very strong proponent of central bank independence. And if I may quote from one of your speeches, you said that the government plays T20 while the central bank is in for a test match. Can you please explain what is so crucial about central bank independence? Uh, uh, one, I want to state at the outset that this is not just true in India, this is true all over the world. Uh, maybe there are forces in India that make it a little bit stronger, as I explained in that speech uh, on the importance of you know independent regulatory institutions, including the central bank. Uh, essentially, there are political uh, compulsions and constraints on part of governments. Uh, they are focused on next term elections. Uh, in India, it could be you know, the state election cycle, which is roughly at least every year, if not more frequent than that. And, um, you know, that creates tremendous pressure to do revenue expenditures. Uh, you want to do things that are visible, distribute things that will cater to 
populist instincts of the vote banks that you are trying to swing towards you. Uh, all this requires by funding and financing, uh, either at the level of the states or federal government. Uh, and therefore, there's always an instinct to want to keep interest rates low so that the government can keep rolling over their borrowing programs at low costs. Now, of course, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, expenditures, pump priming of the economy doesn't come for free. Uh, sometimes it can mean that the central bank is forced to keep interest rates low, even if inflation is rising. Uh, many countries and central banks are facing that sort of a situation right now. I think in the last year, many would argue with, at least certainly with the benefit of hindsight, that the central banks were low to rein in the pent-up demand post-pandemic, which was meeting the supply-side adjustments. And I think the same has happened in India over and over combination of election cycles or growth shocks have led to fiscal expansions funded by easy monetary policy, allowing inflation to run rife, uh, very often having CPI and or WPI, the consumer price inflation and the wholesale price inflation, getting close to or even above double digit levels. If the central bank doesn't uh, adjust for this in time, which is that you have to sacrifice a little bit of short term growth, in order to bring inflation down so that demand is more stable over the long run uh, and you don't get into an upward wage spiral or inflation getting out of control uh, as you see in Argentina or Turkey on a repeated basis. Uh, so the central bank has to make that short-term sacrifice of growth, but of course that short-term sacrifice of growth is not going to be liked by someone who's playing a T20 like a politically uh, charged or populist uh, government. So that's the sense in which I think the central bank is focused on winning a test match. It has to win session after session. And sometimes that means not scoring too many runs in one session. You don't get a high growth number in every single year or a couple of years because you're actually preparing the economy structurally to set it right for the long run. Uh, so I think this conflict is at the root of monetary and fiscal uh, adjustments that an economy has to make. There's an increasing view that monetary and fiscal have to coincide and they have to be coordinated in order to get out of problems. Uh, I disagree with that logic. Yes, uh, every now and then uh, you get a shock like COVID or global financial crisis. In the immediate aftermath of that, you have to coordinate. But once the long run structural parameters of the economy don't look right, such as inflation starts running above your target zone, uh, or you know you are seeing growth impulses that are showing up in wage spirals in the economy, then the central bank has to start paying attention to the long run structural stability of the economy. It's hard to argue two years later after a pandemic with all the slew of more unprecedented monetary and fiscal packages we have unleashed uh, that central banks should not actually focus on the long run structural stability of the economy. Now, there are times, uh, you know, I get, I do, let me just add one question of my own shaker to you, which is that, of course, the central bank is uh, legally mandated to focus on price stability uh, and sometimes on long run employment and economic growth. Whether a particular set of central bankers stick to that legal mandate or whether they deviate from it and want to actually interpret their mandate in a manner that either consciously or subconsciously favors the government playing T20, that depends upon the set of characters which are uh, in, on the stage at that point of time. Uh, some central bankers are more uh, growth oriented, some central bankers are more structurally oriented with long run stability. Uh, some central bankers may be almost explicitly politically political appointees, uh, as they are in many countries in the world. Uh, so, you know, there are shades of gray all along this spectrum. I don't mean to say that every central banker is necessarily playing a test match. What I meant to say in my speech was that a central bank is legally mandated in most countries to play the test match. Whether they play or not can also be managed by the governments through their choice of appointees. And, and of course, that's the deeper political economy of central bank uh, independence and its erosion that we have to watch out for. 
the current pandemic has probably exposed quite a few central banks, at least when it comes to their mandate about controlling inflation. For instance, US has had one of the largest inflation in the past four decades. Uh, we can, of course, talk about all the central banks in the world, but let's focus on specifically the RBI. We know in the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting, there was no change in the RBI policy, despite there being enough signals about expected trend of high inflation in the Indian economy. So what do you think explains the RBI's stance on inflation? And if I may bring in a more general point over here, which is RBI is both the debt manager as well as it has to manage the inflation. Do you think both these roles are incentive compatible? So, uh, you know, having been a central banker myself, of course, uh, I tend to think that sometimes it's hard to second guess what's going on in the minds of the central bankers. Uh, you know, you pointed out one conflict of interest that's almost sitting uh, with the Reserve Bank of India because it's both the debt manager for the government as well as the manager of inflation. Uh, let me start with that on my first point, which is that uh, personally, I would like to think of the debt management role of the central bank as managing the auction process rather than setting the price. I think the central bank should not worry about what is the market determined price for borrowing in my view. I think, I think that's for the market forces to play out and do it. Uh, I think that's one way to minimize the conflict. Unfortunately, perhaps given the legacy of how the central bank has interpreted its role of being a debt manager, it's always focused on the auction yields and you know uh, what they turn out to be, sending signals about what's the right level of yield for the for the government bonds in India to trade at, etc. Uh, I'm not in favor of that. It's it's trying to set the market price, just like RBI used to set the exchange rate uh, like several decades back. I think we have to move away from that system. I think we, we can't live in that world of 70s and 80s where central bank was setting exchange rate, interest rate, doing sectoral allocations of credit. I think if we are going back to that era, I'm sorry, you know, that's not for a modern economy in my view. Uh, second, I would say, uh, you know, these have been very hard times. So, of course, the slew of accommodations that were done uh, by the central bank are justified by the pandemic shock, the, the nature of the first lockdown, maybe the lack of fiscal capacity that the country had probably not to add on to more debt, perhaps to avoid a downgrade by the rating agencies and so on. Uh, but the question is, ultimately, you know, you have a legal mandate, which is your price stability. There's a flexible inflation targeting framework in place. Uh, and as I was saying, uh, the way a central bank builds credibility over the long run is to be willing to actually uh, sacrifice a little bit of growth in the short run. Why is Rahul Dravid a credible middle order uh, test match batsman? It's because he's willing to leave some rank balls outside the off stump because he really won't throw his wicket away. You know, that's that's the way I see it, uh, sticking with the cricket analogy. The same way a central bank, by avoiding these balls that are going way outside the off stump, uh, often builds credibility that, you know, they are not going to sacrifice uh, inflation credibility for short-term growth. And the way, the only way to build this credibility is one, of course, you need to have a framework in place you have to have then created some stock of credibility by having sacrificed growth when inflation is running above your target to bring it back in. Uh, every time you don't do that, you are actually eroding that credibility. It's not enough to keep saying that, oh, we have a framework and I believe uh, in inflation uh, stable, uh, targeting, etc. because that's cheap talk. Ultimately, it's your actions which are causing the markets and investors to revise your priors as a central banker uh, for sticking to the inflation targeting or not. So the more and more the CPI keeps deviating from the mandated target of 4%, uh, the more and more you are eroding uh, on that credibility. And that's true of every central bank that chooses to make or not make these sacrifices. So I think uh, that's a question that has to be asked. Uh, and third, I would say, of course, someone like me who is more of a stickler to the legal mandate of the central bank saying that unelected officials, uh, technocrats such as central bankers 
should not get into generous interpretations of their legal mandates. Uh, the legal mandate has a very clear uh, band which is said the RBI interpreted that band and the target to mean roughly at one year horizon or slightly longer, but not like five years or four years or something like that. So if you're going to keep deviating from that, uh, you know, it gets into very tricky territory in my view. And I think at least my understanding from the most recent reactions of economists, analysts and markets as well is that it's no longer just sticklers like me, uh, but also I think markets at large who are perhaps a bit surprised with uh, RBI's excessive focus on growth uh, at the expense of reigning in inflation. Uh, you know, there is a point at which you can always stick to an accommodative stance and there will always be growth, growth shocks that you can say, oh, I have to accommodate this, I have to accommodate that. Uh, but I think when inflation has been on a persistent basis above your target for a long time, uh, at some point you have to accept that structurally high and you have to do something about it. Uh, second, if your accommodative policy is also not able to close the output gap beyond a point, you have to ask yourself a question whether your models of potential output for the country are right or not, which is are you dealing with a cyclical shock or are you dealing with a structural underperformance of the economy on a repeated basis? Because, you know, you can't have accommodative policy for years at stretch that's unable to actually arrest the output gap and then you neither revise your potential output models nor do you accept that inflation is actually persistently high above the target. So I think we are running into some, I would say, potential inconsistencies uh, in statistical interpretation of data, what the legal mandate of the central bank is, and how it is actually revising upwards or downwards its inflation projections and growth forecasts, uh, respectively, in reaching the decisions it does. Uh, I think we have had pressures on fuel prices even otherwise. We have a tightening monetary cycle coming from the Federal Reserve given sort of uh, very high levels of inflation in the US not seen in, in the last three decades. Uh, all of this means that the external sector uh, concerns of capital outflows, etc. have to be managed. Inflation credibility more than anything else is the first and foremost defense against external sector vulnerability. Uh, capital management, reserves-based interventions in FX markets to manage volatility, all that comes next. Uh, if you don't have inflation credibility, uh, you will get a sudden stop and an exodus of capital uh, flows that may be uh, too hard to defend against in the short run. Let's build on this systemic risk angle uh, in the external market a little bit more. We know that high level of central bank reserves can curtail this external market risk. Now, this brings me back again to one of the heated debates during your tenure, which is about what is the optimal level of central banking reserves. Now, there was, of course, this debate about the optimal level. But since you have gone back, did you get a chance to rethink about this question? And if you can pinpoint at a number, uh, what is the optimal level of these reserves? Right. So, uh, I think the right conceptual framework is that the reserves have to be thought of not in relationship to the GDP of the economy. You have to think about it in the context of what's your external sector vulnerability. What are the hot money or fickle uh, money flows which during the easy phase of the global financial cycle pour into India chasing higher returns? Uh, you can call them carry trades or, you know, uh, uh, sort of... Uh, you know, Fed, uh, Fed uh, sort of uh, stimulated uh, global economy flows that are coming into India, which will reverse when Fed starts raising interest rates or if there is some growth shock or a vulnerability like the pandemic uh, or, you know, sometimes it could even be an idiosyncratic event like a sovereign default in emerging markets uh, that causes a general risk off uh, from emerging markets as a whole. Uh, Historically, we have thought about short-term external liabilities as like, and I would say debt liabilities as the primary vulnerability. Uh, and, you know, the Guidotti Greenspan rule is that a country should have at least as much uh, dollar stock of reserves as these short-term external debt liabilities that a country has. 
Now, over time, there are revisions to this because in the past, most foreign held debt of emerging markets used to be external currency denominated dollar or euro or pound denominated. Uh, post the taper tantrum, emerging markets are issuing a lot of local currency denominated debt, which is held by foreigners in the form of foreign portfolio, uh, uh, foreign portfolio investments in debt, FPI debt, as the, the sort of data field calls it. Now, what that means is you have to worry about sudden stop hitting those flows as well. Now, it's true that if foreign investors are holding rupee denominated debt, they will be exposed to currency depreciation. But what you are observing in data over the last two years is that therefore it is precisely this debt that is leaving early in the risk off cycle because they don't want to be exposed to a bigger currency depreciation because they will be exposed to that being held in the local currency. Uh, the second wrinkle on this that I would add uh, is that you have to also assess whether the easy commodity cycle, easy global financial cycle has contributed also to fickle flows in your equity markets. Uh, historically, uh, foreign portfolio flows in equity have been thought of to be long term stable flows just like FDI flows. But my sense is when the global stimulus has been of such a scale as post-pandemic from the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government through its fiscal stimulus, it's not so clear to me that emerging markets can assume that FPI equity flows will remain stable. In fact, we are seeing this in India in the last two or three months. They have started leaving the Indian equity markets. So I, I think that uh, reserves adequacy can't is not about a particular number. It's about a stress test calculation, which is when your external sector comes under stress, what sort of capital outflows will you observe? Is it just your short term external debt? Is it your short term external debt plus also local currency denominated debt that's held by FPIs? And should you be adding a chunk of your FPI flows? Uh, so I don't have a single number that one can think of, but I think just because a country's dollar reserves are increasing, uh, Augustine Carstens of BIS in his prior work has shown that one cannot assume that reserves adequacy is improving because your external vulnerability may be increasing precisely at the same time as when your dollar stock of reserves is increasing. So overall, if you compare, do you think the systemic risk in the global market is higher currently relative to, let's say, 2008-2009? I know it's a very broad question, but do you have a sense of where the market is headed and specifically given the current crisis emerging in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, there's a sense in emerging markets that we are in a more stable position because they have more dollar reserves, as you said. And probably many of the countries, including India, look slightly better on an external sector resiliency standpoint. Where countries are looking worse uh, as a, uh, emerging markets taken as a group is on fiscal stability. And I think that's the uh, development over the last 10 years that is far less appreciated, um, which is that uh, not just advanced economies, but even emerging markets have raked up huge quantities of sovereign debt uh, over the last uh, decade. Uh, they are actually right now at an all-time high in terms of relationship to GDP. If you add to that external sector corporate debt uh, that their corporations have issued, actually external vulnerability might look worse. Uh, but let's stick to the fiscal uh, health indicators. Uh, in some preliminary work I'm doing as to what were the drivers of vulnerability at the time of, say, uh, global financial crisis and taper tantrum, and even 2018, uh, when we had an oil price shock, relative to the uh, vulnerability that we experienced right in the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, it seems that the post-pandemic vulnerability manifested more in the cross-section of countries as a function of fiscal vulnerability. And I think this is where countries should not get blindsided uh, by thinking that, oh, because we have external sector stability, we are all fine because actually on fiscal indicators, they don't look as good as they were in the past. And I think more questions may be asked on that front as investors discriminate across countries uh, in the coming year when the tightening cycle takes hold. 
Uh, moving away from the current set of questions, I'll ask your opinion on the fintech market because that's seeing a very large boom. Uh, we have seen very large growth in the cryptocurrency market, so much so that some of the central bankers, they are themselves thinking about rolling out a central bank digital currency. I know, once again, it's a very broad question, but I want to have your opinion on what developments do you see on the regulatory front? Yes, uh, you know, on cryptocurrencies, I don't have too much to say. I I think of them just as a speculative asset class. Uh, maybe it's become extremely popular because of the low negative, low or negative real interest rates that, uh, you know, have been engineered after the pandemic shock. And, you know, maybe people are looking for stock-like investments in other space. Um you know, I think they will come under regulation the way speculative investments do, like stocks and real estate and so on. Uh, I think what is perhaps most interesting for India is the maybe the digital backbone of all this, which is that, you know, we have a very good, uh, extremely advanced and sophisticated payment system in India. We now have the Aadhaar-based uh, unique ID and its verification and authentication uh, being possible for various uh, digital and e-commerce transactions. We have a suite of uh, software standards being developed for providing fintech on top of encrypted data transfer uh, to help uh, you know individuals, micro, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises uh, being able to get credit uh, through the formal system. Uh, you know, there is, of course, the advances in blockchain technology, which backs the cryptocurrencies, uh, but I would say has potentially many applications in supply chain management, uh, you know, corporate uh, database management, improving logistics and things like that. So I think, I think to me, what's exciting for India is that digital finance uh, possibility. I think it has the capacity to expand financial inclusion at a fast, at a much faster pace than it happened in the past through traditional banking. It has the capacity to provide a penetration of credit into micro, small and medium-sized enterprises compared to what we have seen. Uh, and third, I would say maybe, uh, maybe more can happen in India on uh, logistics, improving logistics and their efficiency. Uh, and that can bring down the costs of doing business in India in a manner that maybe makes us look more attractive uh, globally. Uh, of course, we need some other things like you know tariff reductions and things like that as well. But I see, I see digital finance part of whatever is going uh, on as being a very big positive for India, both in terms of entrepreneurial space as well as financial inclusion space. Uh, on crypto, my sense is, you know, it's a speculative asset. It will have its boom and bust cycles. Uh, in fact, I think the next year may be challenging for crypto as well uh, as real rates rise uh, and the financial cycle globally uh, takes on a tightening phase. So as I close, I would ask a more personal question. Do you see yourself in a policy role once again in the future? And if you have to suggest young economists, what are the big ticket questions that they should be working on? Uh, yeah, certainly, you know, as I said, for someone like me who does sort of very applied work on financial stability, banking, regulation, uh, etc., uh, it's natural to want to be back in the policy space at some point. Uh, you know, in some ways, a deputy governor's role maybe is the nicest job at the central bank because you can do a lot, but you are not the face of the central bank always. Uh, but, you know, if you had a choice, probably it's a nice thing to, to be a governor of a central bank as well and get that experience. So, you know, but, you know, it could even be at a multilateral agency uh, like the BIS or the IMF. These are also very interesting places to be in in terms of the global regulatory landscape or, or the World Bank. Uh, in terms of uh, ideas that are probably worth uh, thinking about for budding economists, I think I would say... Uh, let me just offer three. One, I think, uh, what are the implications of, you know, balance sheet normalization of central banks? You know, at what speed can it be done? 
how will it play out? What are the challenges that arise from that? I think that's going to be a big question, I would say, for the next five years. Um, second, uh, there is a related question, which is that all this quantitative easing and expansion of the central bank balance sheet has been coincident with government debts actually becoming very large in both advanced and developed economies. So how will these debts actually uh, get liquidated? Will it be done through inflation? Will it get done through growth? Will it get done through financial repression or like uh, some complex mix of these? What are the implications of that for growth uh, and the quality of life for the next decade or two? I think that remains to be seen. Uh, and third, I think the big elephant in the room seems to be sort of wealth and income inequality. Uh, I think many policies that have been stimulative of average growth numbers of economies have not always been stimulative of growth and improvement in incomes at the same pace for the lower income and lower wealth brackets of the economies. Uh, the technological revolution, automation, etc., are at the same time taking away not just the lower end jobs, but now maybe even the middle tier of jobs uh, that used to be available for the less uh, skilled laborers. So I think the society, while it's doing a variety of transitions, uh, has to deal with this head on. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of social discontent. And if I could add to the transitions, you know, a lot of climate change agenda is on the table. Uh, increasingly, the evidence seems to be that it will produce a transitionary phase of high fuel prices because capacity is not being created at the same pace as demand is being stimulated or is uh, requiring uh, fuel inputs. Uh, again, who bears the brunt of high fuel prices? It's again the weaker sections of the society. They don't hold long-term assets that benefit from inflation. Uh, you know, they hold mostly savings or, uh, you know, wages uh, at best. So uh, how, will the tra how will that transition adjustment be? Uh, who will fund it? Uh, will the wealthy in the current generation be willing to pay up finally? They haven't <laughs> through lobbying or otherwise. Or will we just keep adding more and more debts to the balance sheets of government saying, let the future generations pay for all these transitions and uh, current consumption? I think, uh, I think these are some very big intergenerational issues that we have to deal with. And I think uh, economists who shed light on these sorts of issues, balance sheet normalization, debt normalization, uh, and transition dynamics uh, due to automation, uh, digital revolution, climate change, I think these are some big issues to tackle uh, for, uh, for the budding economists. Yes, it's definitely challenging, but also exciting at the same time to see some of these transitions during our lifetime. I'm sure a lot of young minds would be working on solving these problems. So once again, thank you, Viral, for taking out your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you, Shekhar, and all the best to all the students and the ISB community that's hearing this. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you.